Hi, everyone, and welcome to two of Texas Folk Life's 2022 Apprenticeship Program Virtual Showcase. I'm Marco Guarino, the Program Coordinator for Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk and Traditional Arts Program. Thank you so much for joining us. Since 1987, the Apprenticeship Program, the training, Hi, everyone, and welcome to part two of Texas Folk Life's 2022 Apprenticeship Program Virtual Showcase. I'm Marco Guarino, the Program Coordinator for Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk and Traditional Arts Program. Thank you so much for joining us. Since 1987, the Apprenticeship Program has supported the training of hundreds of folk and traditional artists throughout the state. And each year, Texas Folk Life provides $3,000 awards to eight artist mentors, ensuring the opportunity for them to equitably offer one-on-one -on -one training in art, cultural, or heritage practices to dedicated practices over the course of six to eight months. Rooted in intensive extended periods of observation and demonstration, conversation and practice, apprenticeships are often a private matter held between the mentor and apprentice. Our virtual showcase provides a unique public facing window into the collaboration of this year's artist teams. Tonight, our apprentices in Western Swing Guitar, Vina, Conjunto Accordion, and Accordion Tuning will share the skills, techniques, lessons, experiences, stories, and memories they gained while fostering their respective traditions throughout the program. I am very excited to introduce our first apprentice, Manuel Tovar from Brownsville and his mentor and conjunto accordions, Juan Longoria Jr. Having performed and taught this music for over 30 years, Juan is one of the conjunto community's leading traditional bearers. An accomplished solo musician, Juan won Texas Folk Life's inaugural Big Squeeze Accordion Competition in 2007. Conteño, a group co with his brother, known for blending conjunto, Norteño and Tejano received the upcoming Conjunto Award from the South Texas Conjunto Association in 2011. In 2013, Juan established Los Fresnes School first ever Conjunto program, a program which he continues to, to direct. He has been a student of Juan at Los Fresnos for the past three years. Manuel's talent was evident to Juan as Manuel became a 2020 Big Squeeze Accordion Festival finalist. This apprenticeship gave Juan the opportunity to share vast knowledge of both the technical 
and cultural aspects of Conjunto Accordion. Please welcome Juan and Manuel as part of Texas Folk Life's 2022 Apprenticeship Program cohort. Juan and Manuel, can you please talk about your experience in the apprenticeship program? First of all, thank, thank you for the opportunity and uh, for for doing what you guys do. I mean, I, I've worked with Texas Folk Life for many years in, in different different um, parts of it, either judging or participated at one point and or mentoring. And and uh, I do want to thank everybody of Texas Folk Live and all the musicians that, that take part of Texas Folk Live and the staff and, and everybody around. Um, we have Manuel Tobar, he's a, one of my former students and, and a, a, a great student, a great musician, a lot of very talented young man here. Um, we we took it upon, once we, we filled out the application and you guys gave us an opportunity to work together for the apprentice program, um, we focused on a lot of what you mentioned, uh, techniques, skill set, uh, arrangements that, that uh, go along with our with our music, um, creativity. He, he's very creative. I, I uh, and I would like to just say that I kind of teach him the base from there, the the foundation of it, and he kind of picks it up. and And I tell him to be his own person, his own musician to listen to all the other type of music not just our style of music uh, uh so he could learn as a musician to to be able to to get different ideas and become a better overall musician for 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 himself in that sense he's an excellent vocalist as well so he has a lot of potential to to do good in, in music and and have a good career well, first of all, my name is Manuel Tovar. I am 18 years old, and I'm from Brownsville, Texas. Um, we started learning with the basics, which was the scales first, uh, working my way through scales and trying to learn those for first. And then after that, we started learning the melodies, like the polkas or s songs like that. And then I went with the with the keys, with the tonos, uh, what certain uh, ton what tonos are, what do they do, what are they for, what keys certain songs are in and then i started and then i went with the uh, transposing music uh from one key to another which was very difficult but i managed my way to work through it and yeah that's how i that's how i've learned i think that's the toughest part as, as an accordionist or as a instrument of that does a melody and has to like trumpet saxophone like based on the singer that you might have that's what the the chord structure you're going to play and in, in the diatonic accordion each chord every key you play it differently so that that's that's the task that we have as accordionists when it comes to this type of music uh you get different singers it could be female male and they have different ranges so you need to know how to transpose the song and the arrangement so um and he he's he's done really well with that so uh, i'm very proud of him on that i don't know he, he could uh i could maybe demonstrate like some skills and then I'll, I'll let him take over the the other part but for example we just when we first started it's just the f scale as basic as it goes and then we could go um Little. stuff like that so so they could get their fingering their placement I, i'm really like make sure to do it like this so you could be able to play at one point like this and and so he's gravitated to it and uh he's he's learned a lot and and he, he's extremely talented so i wish him the best on that but i don't know if you want to Play a couple of songs or just give them some techniques that you might have learned. Oh, uh, play a porquita. <laughs> Thank you. 
rock island here in el conjunto uh, we also i mean we we keep track with the modern obviously um being around young students and, and they say somewhat they culture me right what's in and what's not when it comes to the uh to the modern music but i always emphasize as well and teaching them the traditional stuff as well like what i learned from my father i kind of pass it on to them and and what i when it comes to valses trotices redovas guapangos uh, uh and things that you might not hear nowadays when it comes to popular music and and at one point they were uh, and i try to emphasize on the 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 iconic figures the true pi the pioneers that that left this music um for us so we could learn it and study it more and and, and in fact uh redova chotiza he learns uh, chotis right también uh a vals uh a real beautiful vals that he learned as well so um he learned about for example pioneers like ruben bella and paulino bernal and, and the list goes on um that they might not have no idea if we, we don't teach it to them so it's not just music in general we also teach them about the history of the music and, and so they could appreciate the what those uh pioneers left to us and, and we fo i have focused on that with manuel and, and he likes the history of it as well so um i don't know you want to play it like a vase or trotis or a play a vals. <laughs> time for one more little piece for you guys hope you guys whoever listening to us hope you guys enjoying it and um okay and thank you once again texas folk life for, for everything that you do to help all types of music uh, and and um uh i can't say enough thank you i mean you you've been a big part of, of uh, who i am and opened the doors for giving me a lot of opportunities and luckily i get to work with uh with young students and i i get to mentor them and leave that legacy that my that my family left to me so you want to do wapango polquita yeah. uh, wapango? wapango yeah and uh, thank you guys have a good one some serious shredding uh thank you juan and manuel um so next is uh it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh apprentice uh vishnu doka from austin um and his mentor rajaswari pariti from argyle vishnu has been surrounded by the veena his entire life when he was five years old he began training under his grandmother and now mentor rajaswari Hailing from a musical family in Andhra Pradesh, India, mentor Pariti learned Veena from her father and has subsequently dedicated her life to the instrument. She has taught, performed, and composed Carnatic music for over 54 years. 
As a former faculty member at Telugu University in India, Bariti trained students studying for their advanced degrees in Veena performance. Bariti also performed extensively for various programs associated with India's national public radio. Having earned the network's highest artistic distinction, she now lives in the United States and is currently the artistic director of Rajavina School of Music in Dallas. She is also a returning artist mentor, having participated in the 2007 apprenticeship program. Vishnu actively performs for local community events and competes in national competitions. The apprenticeship program has served as an opportunity for Vishnu to refine his skills in Veena so that he may continue his family's musical legacy. Welcome Vishnu as an apprentice of the 2022 cohort. Vishnu, can you tell us about your experience through the apprenticeship? Yeah, so hi everybody, my name is Vishnu. I'm, uh, I'm 16 years old and I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Marco and all of Texas Folklife for this opportunity. Uh, it really helped me grow as a musician and kind of strengthen my bonds to my family and like my skill in Vina. I'd like to start off the presentation by talking about what I have in my hands here. This is a Vina, uh, a classical Carnatic string instrument hailing from South India. That's kind of similar to the sitar, if you've heard of it, except it's on your lap, obviously, and not upright. It works like most stringed instruments, uh, where you just have the string and you pluck, except unlike the violin or the cello or other Western instruments, you don't use a bow. It's more similar to the guitar where you place your fingers on the fret and you hear a note like that. Going into this program, I had, a, I had two big goals that I wanted to see to fruition. First off was learning and mastering five different ragas. Uh, you see in Carnatic music, a raga is sort of like a key signature in Western music where it dictates what notes are a part of the song and what notes like are available for you to play with, I guess. In Carnatic music, we have 72 melakarta or parent ragas, which are, which are just made up of eight notes up and down, except the rule of a melakarta raga is that you can't skip any notes or jump around. Uh, those 72 parent ragas give way to mo even more child ragas, which have more space to deviate and uh, kind of jump around, play, and like they don't have to play all the notes in that scale specifically. With this, obviously, you can see that Carnatic music has a lot of space for variety. Uh, each raga is represented in what's called an arohana and an avarohana. Basically, an arohana is just the part of the scale that goes up, and the avarohana is the part of the scale that comes down. We kind of split that up into two because you can you can kind of sort all the ragas out like that. The five ragas that I learned over the course of the mentorship were Sankara which I'll play the Arohana Varohana. Kalyani. Maya Marlava Gorda. Padvarali. And finally, Charu Kesi. So you can kind of see how there's little uh, differences in between each raga, which sets them apart from each other. The other big goal that I had to learn in this uh, opportunity was more about the extemporaneous art of Carnatic music. Uh, this sort of improvisation shows up in three major ways in all of Carnatic music. Uh, there's the raga alapana, tanam, and swarakalpana. These three, well, while they're all improvisational pieces, they're distinctly different in when and how they're played. Swarakalpana is usually in the middle of the piece or near the end and ties in, uh, ties in the improvisation directly into the piece as it leads from one verse to another. 
So what's written on the page, you kind of you kind of like go off of it and deviate and like uh, improv and then come back on. Uh, however, Raga Lapana and Thanam are different in where they're kind of set aside from the piece, usually at the beginning, and uh, both use the patterns and the that are common to the Raga itself to express the emotions and often uh, are played before the piece as an intro to that specific Raga. The difference between these two, however, is that Raga Lapana uses, uh, it, it's more free flowing and it's less rigid than Thanam. And Thanam uses the idea of Thanam, which is very prevalent in Carnatic music and incorporates that into the playing of, of the piece. The idea of Thanam is like pretty prevalent in Carnatic music because I like to think of it as a combination of time signature and count structure that you see in Western music where it dictates the beat and how much like time or beats you have to play the music and how you read the music itself. Uh, on Veera, there's four main strings, but on the back here, there's three other strings that run across the Veera. Those three strings are used to indicate Tara. So it sounds like this, like that. Uh, the most common Tara in Carnatic music is by far Adi Tara, which follows a simple eight piece structure and is played like this. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Uh, today I'll be playing for you all a bit of improvised thanam, uh, along with part of a piece called Saroja Dalanetri. Uh, both will be played in Sankara Bhagnam Ragam, and Saroja Dalanetri will be set to Adi Dharma. <laughs>
Yeah, so that was the improvisational part, and now I'll play the actual piece. <laughs> I'd like to thank Marco and Texas Folklife for this wonderful opportunity, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining in today. That is such yes. a beautiful instrument. Thank you, Vishnu, for sharing that with us. Um, now I would like to introduce apprentice Eric Wang from McKinney and his mentor, Daniel Chen. Eric, now in high school, started playing the erhu, a traditional Chinese two-stringed bowed fiddle in elementary school. After moving to the US in 2018, he became a student of the Erhu to Daniel Chen. The Erhu has served as a connection between Eric and his native China, as well as a connection to the Chinese community in Texas. Daniel Chen's career spans over 40 years as a professional Erhu soloist and educator in China and the United States. He is a key facilitator within the community and directs the Huayun Chinese Ensemble a premier Chinese orchestra based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, while maintaining an active studio of Erhu students. Through the apprenticeship program, Eric has been able to learn new pieces and improve his technique, as well as actively promoting the Erhu within the Chinese immigrant community. Please welcome Eric and Daniel as part of this year's Texas Folklife Apprenticeship Cohort. Hello everyone, I'm Eric. Hello everybody, I'm Daniel Chen. Very glad to see you, everybody, and uh, appreciate the uh, Marcos and the uh, Texas Folk Life program. And uh, we are very glad to have this opportunity to show our instruments today. And uh, and thank you for Marcos already introduced uh, our instrument, our who. And uh, this is uh, this is called the our who and. Uh, it has a two strings, so called a two strings fiddle, and uh, some people call it a Chinese violin. And uh, uh, it has about a thousand years history in China and uh, appeared about uh, in Tang Dynasty. And uh, now it, it's very popular uh, in uh, some Chinese traditional orchestra. And uh, in uh, most of uh, music school, they has uh, they has that uh, degrees. So even uh, 
master and uh, doctor degrees uh, for our full major. And uh, uh, the sound is like this, because it's uh, two strings. that uh, Mr. Liu Tianhua uh, is a uh, modern, modern uh, Arab father in China and uh, he uh, composed a lot of uh, etude and uh, solo songs in 1930s and uh, he uh, teach the Arab in uh, Beijing University and uh, taught a lot of students and uh, it's a milestone of our full education and uh, now uh, we practice uh, one of his famous songs called Marching on the Bright Future and uh, Eric uh, learned this song for about a couple of months and we practice and uh, now uh, Eric learned a lot of the skills to uh, play this song and uh, also we practice another song called uh, Fisherman Return, Fisherman's Boats Returning in the Dusk that's uh, recomposed uh, from a China, ancient Chinese song and uh, that's uh, also very famous uh, songs like uh, describe the, the scene of the quiet lake and the fisherman's uh, life and uh, now uh, now uh, Eric can uh, play some pieces of these two songs and the show he uh, made some pro progress in the last couple of months. Okay, now so this one I'm playing right now is part of the, um, the fishbowl returning from dusk. <laughs> So this is like um, the beginning portion of this piece, and um, through this program, I did learn a lot about her in this piece as well. As my mentor mentioned, this piece is recomposed from a really ancient um, Chinese um, song. So I learned that what it is trying to express is a really um, serene scenes. So in order to play this piece well, I not only have to play you know, the basic notes, I also have to be able to express what it is trying to show because um, it, is, it is trying to show like the serenity of the lake. And in order to show that, it does require a lot of technique, which is also what I learned throughout this program. And so um, first of all, of course, I have to, some notes, I have to play it softly and some notes I have to play it strongly to express what um, the piece is trying to say. And of course, another hard part about this song is um, changing the hold, like um, this is right here. Oh, uh, I will just um, move this. Uh, apologies. Anyway, um, so, one of the hard parts is like like I said the hold. So right here right now is the first hold. And of course, in order to play more notes, and 
I do have to go down another one, and I have to go down precisely and really fast in order to express the piece well enough, which is a really hard thing because this, um, like changing the hold, I would say I learned that it is actually um, one of like the fundamental techniques of Erhu because as um, my mentor Daniel said, Erhu only has two strings and compared to, you know, violin and piano, which has had a lot more strings, um, being able to express and play that many notes um, from just two strings is really challenging. So this technique of changing holds in, in our who is really important. And I was able to improve my technique through this program and through my um, learning from my mentor, Daniel. And another piece we have been working on is called the March Towards Bright Future. And this one um, is pretty historical because this, um, the composer of this piece is Mr. Liu Tianhua, and he composed it in 1930s, which is almost 100 years ago. And this piece is, I also learned that this piece is actually the only marching song in Erhu solo history. So it's really significant, and I'm really happy that I got a chance and opportunity to learn this, uh, this, song, this song piece. And as for the techniques in this piece, um, this involves another really um, challenging technique, I would say, really heavily in this song, and that is staccato. And um, as many of you know, staccato is um, fairly easily, fairly easy to play on piano or violin. But for Erhu, it gets a little bit challenging. And on top of that one, in this piece, the way from um, from the way it was written, I have to do staccato in one bow, which is which will look something like like this. Like I cannot change bow. I have to do multiple staccato in one bow, and that is one of the challenging techniques I have been working on. And thankfully, I did manage to pull that off. And this is really important too because. Um, Erhu can play multiple, can play um, different type of um, local Chinese music, like different styles. And staccato is really important depending on the region. On some regions, staccato um, uh, is, on some regions, some of the, um, the pieces are mainly composed of staccato. So it was really important to me to learn this technique and practice it well. And besides that, another challenging part of this song is actually the ending, which is a um, tre tremolo, which is a tremolo, which will look something like this. It's um, fairly long, so I have to continuously doing tremolos for a while, which is a really challenging because in tremolos, I not only have to keep um, doing that for for um, however long the piece goes, I also have to make sure I'm expressing myself and expressing you know the the soft part and the and the more strong part of that piece. So I not only have to keep it consistent, but also do have to have a fairly decent understanding of the piece to make sure that I get like which notes I have to play softer and which notes I have to apply more force. So that was really challenging. And throughout this um, program in general, what I learned the most is that um, playing Erhu, the most important thing is actually the expression because um, in terms of the notes, um, like um, Earth, when, you know, violin and piano, they can all play the notes. But what I learned is that what is special about Earth is that it can express the style of um, different local Chinese music, which is something that um, piano or violin cannot do. Like the tremolos or staccato, was applied differently throughout multiple um, different Earth pieces. So, 
Mm-hmm. I have realized that um, in order to play herb well, I no, not only have to know all the scales and how to play all the notes, I do have to master those techniques. And, and I think that's a pretty realization and my skill did improve a lot throughout this program. So I do want to say thank you to Marco and Texas Folk Life for giving me these opportunities. Um, that is all I have to say. Um, well, and I hear I can um, play the first part of the March Toward Bright Future as well. So um, the first part starts like this because it sounds um, about, you know, as the title said, March Towards Bright Future. So it is really hopeful and, you know, strong, ambitious and encouraging. So the first part is like this. is um, similar to the first part. Um, I feel like it's kind of like recalling the first part and that was the tremolo part I mentioned about. So here's that part. <laughs> Thank you, Eric and Daniel. That was really amazing. Thanks a lot. Um, next, I would like to introduce to you uh, our apprentice, Hunter Chavez, and his mentor, Felipe Perez from San Antonio. Mentor Felipe Perez has been playing and tuning accordions professionally since the early 1950s and learned how to play directly from Juan Lopez, the legendary Corpus Christi accordionist known as El Rey de la Redova. While mastering conjunto performance in the Lopez tradition, Mr. Perez also learned how to tune accordions from Valerio Longoria, another renowned conjunto musician known for his innovative approach to tuning. Mr. Perez then developed his own unique system of tuning over the years, experimenting with various reference frequencies, pitch schemes, and reed configurations. Hunter, a previous Texas Folklife apprentice in 2021, as a conjunto music bajo sexto player, is this time fulfilling his interest and talent in conjunto accordion playing. Given his connection to conjunto music, as well as his time spent on stage, Hunter is turning into a real expert. Please welcome Hunter Chavez as part of Texas Folklife's 2022 Apprenticeship Program cohort. Hunter, can you please tell us about your relationship to conjunto music, as well as your experience with Felipe throughout the apprenticeship? All right, thank you all guys very much for having me. Just want to say I uh, really enjoyed the presentation by Eric and Daniel. Um, yeah, so um, I, I kind of grew up with this music throughout my whole life. Um, my grandfather uh, used to play a little accordion back in the day. He was he used to ranch a farm and stuff, so it wasn't really to go out and play places, but around the, the fire, uh, more or less. But um, so I was kind of into Los Alegres de Teran, real old stuff, uh, ranchera music. Uh, not necessarily conjunto or norteño, but kind of the early blend of in between of those. Um, as I got older, I, I kind of started uh, getting lessons uh, with the accordion, right? When I was probably about 15 years old and stuff. And from there, I just had my experiences with it and moved on to the to the bajo sexto. And um, I'm just going to dig in, into it because uh, 
I think there's a little bit that I can kind of show everyone. Um, this is a Honer diatonic accordion. Uh, so these are three reed blocks inside of it. And on each block has multiple reeds, as you can see. Uh, this one in particular is the middle row, which is the second block. The, uh, this is a GCF accordion. So the, the, the middle row is the, the C block. Um, uh, so it being diatonic, when you hold a note going in, in pushing in or pulling out, uh, there's going to be two different notes instead of uh, chromatic, chromatic where you could hold one button, go in and out, and be the same. So for the diatonic purposes, uh, these blocks are, are equipped with for each, for each button, there's two, two notes. But there's two different positions going in and going out. So there's four reads to each note. But, uh, on this one is a 31 button diatonic accordion. And so therefore it's 124 reads. Um, the, when it comes from the factory, the bottom, this is how we usually can sometimes tell. And from the factory, it's usually 440 tuning. Uh, but the bottom row right here, starting from the long piece is usually around the 440 area on the tuning settings. Um, 440 being standard tuning throughout music. And so when we, when I was learning through Felipe, um, we, we got to writing the 440. I don't know if y'all guys can see that right there. The 440 process on the bottom row. And we would tune this to a OT120 OT tuning process. And this shows actually the the sense, uh, the, uh, the sense and the frequencies to where it could be 440 if, or if you wanted to go lower, flatter or higher, uh, sharper, you can do so. And it'll show you actually where more or less uh, where you would be on the sense of the scale. Um, now, when we tune the bottom row, the 440, we like to keep it right in the middle, you know, the thread being right, right down the line. And then from there, we can adjust the top row, whether you want it to be a 440, which would be flat, or a, um, you know, where it has a little bit more flavor, a little bit wetter sound. The frequencies will kind of collide with each other. And usually the top row, uh, you know, talking to Felipe, we kind of like to keep it somewhere in the sweet spot of uh, 10 cents to 13 cents high. Um, uh, a little bit about me and Felipe's relationship on how we got into this process this past December, um, early December, we both were playing at the Fiddle Festival in, in Blanco, Texas. And um, that that led to us actually getting in contact. Felipe had reached out to me one day saying that he was looking for a bajo sexo player. And uh, I just happened to play a little bit. And uh, I've, I've known of Felipe, I never met the man until then. And uh, I've known of Felipe from seeing him on YouTube and through the videos and uh, the reason doing so was because, uh, like Marco was saying, you know, Felipe was taught under Juan Lopez, which is a very historic uh, accordion player from from Corpus Christi. Um, me looking into Juan Lopez's music and getting into all that really got me diving into the style, the tradition, kind of where it comes from here and there. Uh, but when I when I saw Felipe, I had I had never seen anybody play that style the way he did. Um, Felipe plays it true to the nature and to the tone. Um, so when I met him, I knew who he was, of course, uh, but I had never never met him until then. And he, he gave me a call one day saying that he was looking for a Bajo player and if I can come over and, and uh, practice with him. And so I said, of course, of course I would. Uh, I jumped on it as quickly as I can and uh, and I tell you, it's it's really been a, a really nice ride. But getting to know him, we, we we kicked it off pretty good. It was just me and him practicing um, there at his his home in his apartment. And uh, one day he um, one day his grandson happened to be there. He showed up at the same time, and uh, he was saying that he he was into the apprenticeship uh, program for the uh, for this for this year of the accordion tuning. And uh, I happened to see them tune accordions and I was just I was like wow you know because I used to play accordion back in the day and I really haven't picked it up much to be honest with you now um, but being able to see him 
take it apart and do what I've always kind of been tempted to do. Uh, Cause going back to when I picked up the accordion for the first time, I, I, I would take things apart, you know? So of course it, it you just want to just grab the accordion and start looking and digging and see what actually makes a sound. And that's it. I've come to find out, you know, doing through that process that it's a beautiful instrument, um, like all instruments, no doubt. But this one just happens to be a little bit more passionate. I feel with 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 the feeling, you know, you can you can guide and push the air with your hands, or and it's like it's like controlling it like with the mouthpiece or like a reed. But that's that's what going to this this is. It's these are all reed instruments and so it requires a force it requires delicacy or, or aggression however you want to express that feeling um and that's that's what's really intrigued me about the accordion and so being younger taking things apart i've always wanted to know how it was and i, I kind of had the, the idea of it but i never dared attempt it um i was lucky enough to to live in shirts where I'm from, just a few blocks away from another great uh, uh, accordion tuner, Gus Escobar. So uh, when I had a read that needed fixing or anything, an arm or anything, he could he could he could fix it on the accordion, and he would be right down the road for me. Um, so through that process, you know, I, I kind of shied away from it. But when I got to seeing Felipe and his grandson take things apart and start seeing somebody actually tune it. Um, you know, a little bit by hand, kind of the traditional way, you know, a lot of people, you know, rely on, uh, well, you could do it different ways where you have a, a built-in bellow system and you can push the the blocks like that, like with a bellow, just like the accordion. Um, but to do it by, by, by tuning by your mouth, um, you know, doing that is, it, you can do it anywhere uh, on the go. And especially because these things break and there's, quite a bit of them so the odds are it's gonna happen um but when it does Felipe, you could really see in him teaching his grandson that he really really knows what he what he's doing on the accordion and uh to see that was just beautiful and so a few, a few weeks went by and um unfortunately uh, his grandson wasn't able to to continue the apprenticeship so uh Felipe being you know, Felipe being a really cool guy, he gave me a call and he said uh, to keep his program going, if, he, if I would be interested to to take it over and and continue the apprenticeship. And of course, right away, we were, uh, I think it was that, that week we, we got together and started um, tuning accordions and we, we put in quite a bit of, of hours into it, you know, leading up to it now, of course, but, but there was a lot of time we had to make up for, but there's a lot to learn from and um, it's just, the, there's just so many things that I've, I've come to, it's the little, uh, the little delicate stuff that, that's, that's the hard part. It's very tedious and very, uh, it's just tedious. It's just a lot of work to put into for something so, so small. And um, uh, just, I just want to share some of the experiences that I have with you um going through that process uh i haven't seen a lot of people tune accordions you can find a couple of videos on on youtube and stuff but uh to to just get into it um on the bottom row i'm gonna tune the the accordion to 440 and on the top i'm gonna pitch it a little bit higher uh somewhere around again about on average around 10 cents you know i might go a couple a little bit higher um especially towards these smaller reeds. You know, you can see the sizes in the big ones to the small ones, but the big ones require so much air and they're able to, to, to shoot the waves like how they do, but the, the smaller ones sometimes because of their size, they lose a little bit of sound. So you might wanna make, you know, a couple of these or the higher ones a little bit more, just a little bit sharper to where they have a little bit more frequency and they have a little bit more flavor because when you put them in the box, they need to have that attack and that that strength to be able to to be able to overhear, uh, just because they're such smaller reeds in comparison to the to the larger buttons. Um, but just for example, like this one. What so what we do is we kind of just go down a note and then we see, you know, where that sound is. And again, this is you can find all keys right here. 
But so you just find the note where it's at, this one being E. Um, and we use this to, to measure out the, the frequency. Uh, I was going to do the bottom row, which is the 440, which is right on the dot right there. And this top one, which I'm going to make it a little bit uh, sharper. And oh, and by the way, on the, on the E, so right now as this one, All that is sucking in. So when you're breathing in, it's like pushing. It's like if you were to push in the accordion, breathing in. And when you're blowing out, it's like pulling out with the accordion. So it, it kind of sometimes confuses the mind just because of the way, oh, you, when you see the accordion going in, you must be, you know, it's like that's the way it's supposed to be. You're, you're pushing in the accordion. So going back to it on this E, we'd like to keep that one at 440 in this top one, gonna make it a little bit higher. And right here on the scale, we're gonna go to the 10 cents high. So that one's a little bit flat where I like it. So with that being, this is Felipe's handy tool. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this is a old uh, carpet, a utility knife. It's just a blade. And simply, you could just put that in right under this reed. Because right now, what you're going to do with this reed, you may be able to see from there, um, it has grooves on the very tip and right here in the middle. So when a reed is flat, it needs to get higher pitch. And, you know, it needs to go sharper to get it to where you want. You want to hit it on the very tip of the reed to make it sharper, to go higher. And if a reed is, is too sharp and you want to go flatter, you want to hit that and scratch it right in the middle or toward the lower, lower end. And you can do this by many ways. I've seen people use mini files. I've seen people use scrapers, like the ones that they use for the dentist. Um, you could use different types of sandpaper. There's just certain grades that you have to experience with. You don't want to go too fine on it. But you want to be able to create enough friction to be able to scratch these reeds. And so we happen to have a Dremel tool here this is what he, he likes to use preferentially, but he, he uses this and it has a uh, like sandpaper on the end. And so that is just, looks just like that. And all you could do, this is how I like to do it by hand. Uh, and I'm still trying to get to the, um, to be able to use the Dremel tool. But uh, if this one needs to go a little bit sharper, I'm gonna hit it right on the top, right there. And you can hear it scratching. You can feel it scratching. That's actually why I like to do it by hand. And once you do that, why he puts this reed in there is for one, if you don't put anything underneath it, it goes in. So you want to have something to structurally secure it underneath. And once you do this, you've sanded a lot of material away or some material. You don't want it to be on there. So you just simply give it a pluck. You know, pretty decent pluck. It doesn't have to be super hard. Not too light. You want to get it to uh, be able to get off of there. And that's how you, that's how you're able to, to tune it the way you want it. Um, again, so going back to sucking in, that's, that's the outer reeds, the ones on the ones that you can see outside. Now, there are reeds on the inside of, the, of, of each hole. And to get to those, you can use a flat head or there's, there's multiple ways of going about it. But the way he was teaching me is you just stick it in there and you make sure you don't hit it right where the, where the reed is at. And you give it a good, a good soft push like that. And that reed would pop out just like that. And so there's a whole nother reed underneath there. And that's when you're blowing out. Those are the reeds that are inside. So this is where the meticulous part comes because the tedious work to be able to do that for each read, there being two reads each, each note position, four reads each button, um, they really, that's, that's the hard part. And to put it back in, it's simply just put it back in its groove. This is all covered by wax holding in these reads. So when you do that, you just push it back in and sometimes it'll be loose, you know, you gotta, you gotta make sure it's in there properly, nice and straight. And the way to, to be able to kind of melt it back in there is this is a, a hot iron, the hand one. 
And uh, you could just simply run a line like that. Doesn't need to be too hot or anything. And just like that, it is perfectly in there. So that's just tuning accordions in a nutshell. There's many different processings. There's many different tunings, uh, styles, flavors, wets, dries. There's a lot to it. But that's just kind of a hands-on first uh, thing. And I, I hope from everything from there that um, you're able to, whoever is interested, to be able to, to continue this. And uh, don't be afraid to dig in and uh, learn the instrument in, inside it out. Um, I just, I've, I've been real lucky, real lucky uh, to, to meeting Felipe Perez. Uh, he's a wonderful man. I really enjoy his company. Uh, he shared many stories, like Marco was saying, with, with Juan Lopez since he was 15, 16, playing in bars with him in and out, uh, with all, all the way from the great Valerio Longoria, uh, a true master, a true um, uh, relic into the music. And uh, I just I thank you very much, Felipe, for having me and, and uh, being a friend and teaching me all the things that you, you know and, and believing. Uh, thank you to Texas Folk Life. Uh, I just just want to say uh, thank you to uh, Pete uh, Berrupt, the former uh, coordinator for their apprenticeship. Uh, I'd like to, to congratulate him on his newborn and uh, him and his wife. Congratulations. And uh, for Marco uh, Guernino uh, for taking over and being able to uh, fill in that position. Thank you very much for, for having us. Also, Charlie Lockwood, I've known you for you know, a handful of years. Thank you very much, going back to Rito Pena. And uh, um, thank you, Ben, the, the, the Texas Folk Life Tech Coordinator for, for making this all possible and being able to be on time and stuff. Um, just wanna say that this means a lot to me. Um, thank, thank you for, for Felipe for picking me to, to Go as the apprentice and for Texas Folk Life making an exception and approval to be able for me to do so. Uh, it means truly a lot. I plan on doing this for my whole life. Uh, it's something that doesn't just go away, but you get better, better at over time. And uh, that's what this is all about to the uh, to keep it going in the culture. Thank you. I've really enjoyed all the shows and I hope you all guys have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, that is fascinating work. Uh, the the intricate um, engineering design of instruments has always fascinated me. And um, it's really amazing to see it come to life. So thank you for your work as well. Um, before I uh, introduce our final showcase, uh, Apprentice of the Evening, um, I would like to thank the Texas Commission on the Arts who is a vital partner of Texas Folk Life and who helps makes, uh, make these apprenticeship uh, programs possible. Texas Folk Life's apprenticeship program is also made possible by a state partnership award from the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Texas Commission on the Arts and support from the board and members of Texas Folk Life. Additional support is provided by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department Arts Council Wichita Falls, and the Indigenous Cultures Institute. We would also like to extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to Texas Folk Life's Folk Saint members for making this program possible. If you are interested in applying for or would like more information about the apprenticeship program, please contact me, Marco Guarino, at apprenticeships at texasfolklife.org or fill out the apprenticeship program interest form found on the Texas Folk Life website. Application materials for the 2023 apprenticeship program will be available this fall. Please consider supporting the apprenticeship program directly by making a tax deductible donation to Texas Folk Life, clicking on the donate button on our homepage at texasfolklife.org. For more dynamic folk and traditional arts program, programming and initiatives, you can again visit texasfolklife.org and tap those like and subscribe buttons on our social media channels. Our final apprenticeship team of the evening is apprentice Ian Lee from Wimberley and mentor Whit Smith from Austin. 
Focusing on Western swing guitar, Ian concentrated on learning traditional techniques, derived mostly from jazz guitar that most players in modern times have since forgotten. These techniques, however, are integral to the Western swing sound. Part of the Ameripolitan Music Award winning Wimberley based trio, Big Cedar Fever, and leader of his own quartet, Ian is equally formidable as a fiddler, guitarist, singer songwriter, and educator. <clears throat> Through his apprenticeship with Whit Smith, Ian learned many of these traditional techniques and is becoming one of the few among Western Swing's new generation of practitioners to gain direct ties to the progenitors of the music. Whit Smith, an active Western Swing guitar player, has played and recorded with the likes of Cliff Bruner, Johnny Gimbel, and Hank Garland, among others. Through his experiences with these musicians, Witt solidified his own musical skills and aesthetics by confirming the hybridity that lies at the heart of Western swing. For Witt, this is the key to maintaining the tradition, finding and recruiting those who are dedicated to promoting and preserving Western swing as a legitimate art. Please welcome Ian as part of the 2022 Texas Folklife Apprenticeship Program cohort. Ian, please tell us about your experience with Witt. Thank you, Marco. Um, and just have to say that um, I really enjoyed everybody's showcases. That was incredible. I'm, uh, I'm uh, really floored by everyone's um, ability. And I know it takes a lot of hard work to progress in the things that you're trying to grow in. So it was just a blast to watch. And really honored to be a part of this. So um, yeah, so my time with WIT um, was, it's been an amazing experience. I a little backstory on how Witt and I connected. Um, I used to go watch him play when I was a kid, actually, um, which is, it's funny to think about that now, getting to connect. There's a little, well, was a little coffee shop slash bar in Austin called Flipnotics. And of course there's Green Hall. And my mom and my stepdad, who loved Western swing and traditional music in general, um, you know, early American music, um, they would take me to go see the Hot Club of Cowtown, which is Witt's band. And um, some years back, as I was really wanting to pursue Western swing and jazz guitar and um, continue to, to want to get better at this, at these styles and these ideas, because it really is like all these wonderful arts we've seen. It's, it's a lifelong process. Um, I, of course, sought out um, the mentors that I, I could get a hold of that are, that are alive and well, because a lot of the people who generated the music, and maybe their apprentices, have, long past and so there's just these handful of ties left and of course one of the obvious ones or maybe even not so obvious initially but it came to be that i connected with wit um just taking a lesson here or there whenever we both had time and whenever i could afford it and this last year he reached out to me and said hey man you want to do this apprenticeship with me and of course i jumped up and down <laughs> when i got that email it was a great honor um so it's it's really cool to have been somewhere around nine to 12 years old, watching Wit on the stage of hypnotics and now being able to spend so much time with him. And to, I think, call him a friend and, uh, and to, to, to see that relationship develop as well as the music develop. So what is Western Swing as a whole? This is one of the things Wit and I talked about. It's one of the things that I find myself running into because Western Swing is this funny middle genre uh, it's too country for jazz people and it's too jazzy for country people. Uh, but really it's kind of all of it. And, and to me, I love the early American jazz, uh, large space in, uh, for it in my heart. And it, it really, I think comes a lot from that. And Bob Wills actually, who was one of the, um, early pioneers of Western swing was known as the king of Western swing. Bob, of playing all the old jazz standards. There's all these great recordings of his band doing things like T for two, which is, you know, T for two and two, for T, back home again in Indiana, Honeysuckle Rose, all these great jazz standards from the time. And whenever he'd do the dance halls, uh, Whit tells me that the old timers would come up to him and go, oh, Bob, play one of those fiddle tunes, quit playing that, that jazz music. But Bob Wills and his band, they loved listening to Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, um, they love listening to um, Roy Eldridge, uh, Lester Young, Count Basie, all these big bands, right? All these 
all these musicians who were pushing this music forward constantly and it's and it's really it's golden time um and so it's this funny thing that Whit and I actually got to get into a little bit when it comes to Western Swing because we both would laugh at this thing about how it was, you know, if I went up to New York and started playing guitar, they, they might go like, what are you doing over there? You know, but if I start playing in a country band, they're like, what are you doing over there? So we're kind of in this strange category, but it's really beautiful music. And uh, I think one thing that Wit said um, that I really enjoyed and appreciated is that there's a lot of room for virtuosity in Western Swing. There's a lot of room for uh, these virtuosic musicians to come in and perform at this unbelievable level over these tunes. So let's talk about some of the things that might categorize early American and Western swing guitar. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and lower my camera so I'll still be able to, you guys will still be able to hear me. That way you can see what's happening here. So one of the things that you might hear in Western swing in particular, but early American jazz is you might have these tunes be very simple and if anybody's ever looked at like a jazz chord chart you might see a bunch of chords running along it right well let's take a song like bubbles in my beard it's a tune written by a woman named cindy walker she is actually from mejia texas and um she wrote a lot of incredible tunes not just for bob wills but she wrote a number of hits uh she wrote you uh, you give your hand to me uh, you don't know me which you know ray charles made famous anyway so this is a tune i'll sing a little bit of it Tonight in a bar, alone I'm sitting Apart from the laughter and the cheers So you see right there, it's just two chords. You have essentially what could equate to a C major and a G7. But we have these forms that create some different voicings and spaces on the guitar. So we these nice big sounds. Okay? Now, what made the Bob Wills band, and particularly Eldon Shamblin, who was Bob Wills, one of his primary guitar players, was the movement that we could create within these chords. And of course, this was a part of the early American jazz idea anyways, was to say, hey, we don't just have to hang out here. We can suddenly start moving these chords around. So for example, if I were to invert these chords, which means I'm taking the same notes in the chords, but I'm just putting them, you know, essentially in different orders over the guitar. So that's the same chords the one I just played. Same here. Okay, here's another version of these chords. These aren't all true inversions from a music theory standpoint, but these are just different sounds of a C major. Okay, now what we could do then is do something simple like tonight in a bar. Alone, I'm sitting. So right there, I just put in a little move, okay? From here, we can begin to expand that idea. And I don't necessarily need to get into the technicalities of the music theory, but I might be able to do something more like this. And I'm gonna kind of ramp it up pretty quick here because there's some other things I wanna talk about. Tonight in a bar. See, suddenly I took this and that to all that movement. And one of my very favorite uh, jazz educators, a gentleman named Barry Harris, he was um, 91, maybe 92 this year in January when he passed away. Unbelievable musician, um, really, really beautiful player and an incredible teacher. He said that music is movement. It's not just these stagnant things. It, it should flow. It should have this feel. And so part of what Wit does that I'm working on is being able to really, you know, a large part of jazz is improvising. So getting to a point where you have these moves really integrated, really integrated, and you can hear them in a deeper way. And suddenly, you know, that was a planned out arrangement, you know, these things that I've been working on. This is something that I wrote. And there's nothing wrong with doing arrangements by any means, but being able to maybe improvise this harmony a little bit as well. So suddenly the band is listening to each other. I'm doing something maybe a little more spontaneous with this harmony. The bass player is listening. Things come together like that. And it's not always all the same all the time. So this is part of what makes that. 
Um, of course, there are many aspects to what creates Western swing guitar. Something else that Witt and I talked about that uh, comes into the er more into the early American jazz guitar and a little bit into Western swing down the road is harmonizing melodies with triads. Now, in guitar, um, I can play you know any melody. Like if I, I'm going to play a tune called Slowpoke. Now, that's beautiful, nothing wrong with that. But what I can begin to do is harmonize that melody. So I create a larger sound and I can even become my own kind of little miniature uh, orchestra, as it were. Of course, not that large of a sound, but close to it. And let me just talk about what triads are on the guitar. Now, a triad in music really is just any three notes, okay? So technically I could pick that. But that doesn't sound very pleasant. <laughs> I mean, it's not the worst thing I've heard, but you know, that's not what we're looking for here. So typically we talk about what are called closed triads, which means the voices are all right next to each other versus spread triads like that, okay? And so what I can begin to do is not only play with these three note voices, okay? But I can also play with double stops or dyads. So I'm playing with two voices. And this is a little, uh, some guitar players call it chord melody. It's not an inappropriate name, but um, I just like to think of it as just harmonized melody guitar. Um, you're taking your melody, you're understanding the chords that you're working that melody with, and then you're creating these beautiful little arrangements. So this is a tune called Slowpoke, uh, written by Pee Wee King. He was uh, an early Western swing pioneer. He wrote... Um, Let's see, I was dancing with my darling, the Tennessee Waltz, here at the Tennessee Waltz. So, um, I'll play just a little bit of this for y'all, okay? And I'll actually sing a little bit of the song too so you get a feel for it. You keep me waiting till it's getting aggravating, you're slow. I wait and worry, but you never seem to hurry, little slow. Time means nothing to you, I wait, and then... So I was also demonstrating some of that chord movement. Now, here are some triads and some dyads to harmonize the melody. On and on. I'm going to drop it at that point. But you get the point. So that's a very, very common thing. There's a guitar player named Eddie Lang. I don't believe he lived. He was very young when he passed away. Um, and uh, he was, you know, guys like that would use this kind of style all the time, this triadic approach to harmonize melodies. So I think the last thing I'll talk about is my guitar because it is a very traditional uh, jazz instrument. As a matter of fact, it's from 1937. It's a Gibson instrument, and it's called a Super 400. Uh, it was made, as you can see, the body is extra large. This is 18 inches here. And the idea is that if I was playing in a big band um, and I didn't have an amplifier, which guitars were not being amplified much at all, if at all in general, in 1937, you'd still be able to sit there and play behind that big band, and your guitar would be able to cut through just enough to provide that sense of what the guitar could do at the time, which was... Prim primarily that chord movement that I mentioned earlier. Now, of course, these days I don't need to do that. I have amplification. I have the ability to do that. Uh, and this is actually something that I got from Wit. Um, you see this sticky tack on my guitar. Well, I don't want to drill holes in this beautiful, old, precious instrument. So you can put sticky tack on these old guitars, really any guitar you want. 
for that matter, it won't ruin the finish. And then I can take this old um, jazz box, as people will refer to them, and I can amplify it and I can get that sound because a large part of the Western swing sound was an electric guitar, but they would use these. Matter of fact, Eldon Shamblin, Bob Wills' uh, guitar player, who was really one of the innovators of all that really cool chord movement from that era, um, he owned the very first Stratocaster that Leo Fender ever made. And anytime anybody would ever ask Leo Fender about like Stevie Ray Vaughan or uh, you know Jimi Hendrix, he'd be like, "Who? Eric Clapton? Who?" And he'd go, and they'd say, well, "Like, what about Eldon Shamblin?" Oh, oh, Eldon! Oh my gosh! You know, so a little side note there. So, anyways, I, I could go on. Of course, it's there's so much to talk about with all the things that we've learned, but I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, Marco, and thank you for the folk life. This was. Um, a, Incredible experience is an understatement. It was a real joy and an honor, and it's an honor to be a part of a tradition. I think it's a really important thing to have traditions, and um, it, uh, Western Swing is a beautiful thing. I have an authentic love for it, and so it's nice to spend time with Wit, not only because he's a hero, but because he has the same authentic love and fire for it um, that I do. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. That was really great. Um... Love those chords. And that guitar is beautiful also. Um, 1930s Gibson. Um, before we continue, I would like to uh, send the um, utmost gratitude also to uh, Pete Brightheart, uh, the, our, um, our previous uh, program coordinator for the apprenticeship program. Um, without him, uh these apprentices wouldn't exist so um he did all of the hard work here and um i came in last minute to sweep it all together so thank you pete for all your help um our last part of our showcase uh will be a panel uh, a panel discussion led by mark brill um, Mark is currently a, an assistant professor of musicology and world music at the University of Texas at San Antonio. His expertise is in Latin American music, and he has published numerous articles on the colonial music of the Oaxaca Cathedral in Mexico. He is also the author of Music of Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, Mark, for being here. I will leave the floor to you to begin our panel discussion. Good, thank you, Marco. Um, and thanks to everybody uh, who participated in this uh, program. Uh, your passion, to all the participants, your passion is quite refreshing. Uh, it's very gratifying to see this kind of uh, music making and, um, and performance uh, going on, and especially the apprenticeships going on. What you are doing here is pedagogy, right? Uh, this is a, a great window into teaching traditions, and you are all learning not just how to play your instruments, but also how to, how to become teachers. Um, and so uh, I, I really want to ask all of you uh, how this really affected your own teaching. Um, if you think about it, uh, this is the way teaching was done for thousands of years, right? You studied with your, your, your mentor. You studied with your teacher. This whole idea of sitting in a classroom with a professor in front of a classroom is fairly new. That's not how it was done. Um, and so you are learning not just your instruments, but you are learning also how to teach. You're learning pedagogy. And so I want to ask all of you, each of you, um, you've all made the case of how you're learning your instrument, right? Um, and you've done a great job. I want to ask all of you, how has this experience formed you as a teacher? Because someday you too, presumably, not necessarily, but presumably someday you too will be a mentor. You will be a teacher. Uh, you will have um, a whole uh, slew of students uh, who will continue on your tradition, just like you learned from your mentor, your teacher, and your teacher learned from uh, their teacher uh, before that. Um, I guess I really want to start with uh, Vishnu, 
in particular, uh, if I would, uh, because Vishnu, you are the heir of a long-standing uh, Shishna guru, guru tradition, right? Uh, this system of teaching that's been part of Indian music making for hundreds of years, right? And I think your your mentor, who's also your grandmother, is that correct? Yeah. Um, went through that in her youth, right? Mm -hmm. And and things are changing in India now. Um, traditionally, the the student lived in the in the compound with the mentor, with the teacher, for twenty years, right? And they don't really do that anymore and of course now in the states that's that's not really applicable anymore either so i want to ask you um how has this experience shaped your own teaching or your, perhaps your own future teaching uh i mean yeah so i think it like helped build a foundation because really i haven't had much experience teaching before but this kind of built the foundation of like like in the future when I go teach and like speaking on your like on your comment about the Sishya Guru uh, uh, program, it's like it may not be applicable in the states, but like I remember still being like somewhat a part of it because like even when I was little, I was like essentially like shipped off to like Dallas to like hang out with my grandmother for like weeks on end to just like uh, you know just chill and learn and uh, and like that kind of emulates it to like a smaller to a smaller extent. But yeah, also this like kind of just like, this whole experience also brought into like view like the kind of the, the actual like ancestry that I have in this in this art. And uh, more than anything, it just kind of made me want to bring it on even more to the next generations. Sure. Um, uh, let me skip to Manuel, if I could. Uh, because Manuel, you are learning your tradition from Juan, who of course, also learn it from a whole bunch of people. Um, and so you are also continuing the tradition, right? Uh, but at some point, um, and, and you mentioned how you were learning the waltzes and the redobas and all that. Uh, at some point, do you take the tradition and improve on it and move it forward? Uh, Juan, you, you talk about, uh, uh, what is it, con, con genio, right? Or conten, what was it? Uh, conteño, which yes, is after, con, uh, conteño, which, which is, well, if, maybe you could explain conteño, but, but it's something new. It's pushing the tradition forward, right? Well, it's like, like Ian said, like, um, here in the state, and it's just here in Texas because um, a lot of people confuse it, and, and some are diehard norteños, and some are diehard diehard the Hanos and Conjunto, right? But uh, so I grew up in, in Brownsville, Texas, the tip of Texas, like right next to Mexico. So we have all the cultures here. I mean, and we listen to the American culture music, uh, the past, the present. I mean, and then we have all the traditions from Mexico as well. So uh, Conteño means it's Conjunto, Tejano, Norteño. And to some people, I, I personally play to Norteño, to some of the people I play to Tejano. So it, it, it's one of that. that's why I can relate to, to Ian when he said that sometimes the, the way I play or what I teach is right in the middle of, of but I mean, it still gravitates to people. We're still working. It, it, as long as there's, and I tell the students, as long as there's what he said, movement, happiness, it lightens up your day. I mean, you feel the music, uh, like Hunter said, like the accordion, you in and out, you could be real soft, romantic with it. You could be a little bit more aggressive depending on what you play. So it's music, like they said, I mean, that, that movement brings joy to people, you know, and, and, or sadness. You hear a tune, you might cry because you might think of something, but that's the effect that music has. I mean, but I don't know, in Manny's case, what you asked him, I mean, about how he would go from the traditional to the modern. I mean, yes. Uh, well, I, I would, I would say, the learning part, um, the theory, the music theory, would be like the, I feel like the correct way of me learning and being able to uh, teach it to to other people, like the accordion theory, 
maybe like teach it the correct way or like as correct as possible so that I could like teach him something that is correct and not bad, just like how Mr. Longoria did it for me. Um, and yes, going back to your question, I would like to teach it the traditional way, but of course making it a little bit on my own style and adding maybe a little bit, uh, what is it like more like for now? Cause the, the, the way people learn from traditions and then generations is very different as now. So yes, I would uh, teach it traditional way, but with a little bit of my own style as well. Cause music keeps on evolving. Yes. I mean, some people get, they, 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 they're in the eighties and then they're in the nineties and, and then the two thousands, it, it just starts. What was maybe what is traditional right now, in my opinion, might not have been traditional 40, 50 years ago. That that might have been new and they might have had different opinions and, and likes and dislikes and it, it just keeps on evolving. So that's uh, that's what I try to teach them and hopefully they they have that open mindset where they could take that tradition and not forget about that true sound. And if they want to mix it up, I mean, it's ultimately up to them afterwards yeah that, that's always a tension when you're talking about music music of any kind right mm -hmm. because everybody says oh the old music was better right but we as musicians know well not necessarily right we make new music and our the new music isn't always accepted by everybody um ian in in your case you do a lot of very traditional music right texas swing um, is like as you said, music of the 30s and 40s and, and 50s, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you, you can still go to the the uh, the honky tongs here in San Antonio or up in Dallas and, and hear Texas swing. Uh, but do you do you rely traditionally on on the old stuff, or are you pushing the envelope as well? Um, yeah, I, I do rely on the old stuff in in my own write it's it's hard not to just because i love the recording so much but uh it's not like i do write my own music in the style um so i write my own originals and, and my trio the last album we released was majority originals and just a few standards whereas once upon a time a western swing group and even groups like asleep at the wheel who have been around doing this for a long time most of their records are going to be standards um whereas we're doing trying to push more into original music. I mean, Western Swing being uh, under the umbrella of jazz uh, and early of, of all forms uh, was all about putting your own voice and your own spin on it and trying to move it forward in whatever capacity made sense to you. Okay. Um, Eric and Vishnu, I have a kind of a similar question because um, uh, the other guys on the panel perform music that is quite popular in South Texas, right? But the Arhu and the Vina, um, not everybody knows uh, here in Texas and in the States what, what the instruments are, how the music works. Um, how does that affect your learning and how do you think that's going to affect your future teaching? Eric, maybe let's start with you. Um, well, it actually, in fact, it actually motivates me to learn because like so many people don't know it yet, but this instrument, I find it to be really amazing and fascinating because, you know, it only has, it only has two strings, yet it can play so many notes, so much music, represents so much um, Chinese culture. So because of, you know, many people don't know, so I actually do want to master in this instrument and spread it to other people. So I would hopefully um, teach her for one day to um, spread this um, um, this part of Chinese culture to more people, to let more people know. Yeah, An another thing that's kind of a constant in popular music is the, the syncretic mixing of styles, right? And you know that that's how conjunto started, right? It's the mixing of German and Czech and Mexican styles, right? And so. It could well be that the Arhu or the Vina or some other instrument um, in combination with with modern styles will be the next big thing. Uh, you know, but even if it's not, um, the music should be able to stand on its own. Um, and clearly for you guys, it does. Right. I think anybody want to comment on that? Uh, may, uh, let me ask you this. Is anybody thinking of doing a syncretic mix of 
traditional and modern styles with, with other instruments. The possibilities are endless when it comes to, I mean, you could get as creative as possible and, and still have that those traditional instruments involved. So, I mean, Indeed, we could get all five of these panelists and put them together in a room and see what came out of it. I'm sure it would be, it'd be lots of fun. Um, Hunter, I want to talk to you about your uh, accordion tuning, which I thought was fascinating. I, I think I learned more about accordion tuning than anything else on this panel. Um, one technical question, uh, and this comes up with piano tuners. Um, there's always this tension between tuning by ear and tuning with with the with a machine, right? Yes. And the best piano tuners will, will, won't ever get near an electronic tuner, right? They always do it by ear. Uh, but a lot of a lot of piano tuners in modern times now use a combination of both. Uh, so what about you guys? What about accordion tuners? Is it all so, by ear? Go on. Um, just just from my experience, uh, my short experience with the, the actual physical tuning, um, uh, you know, there's there's many different ways of tuning. Um, uh, like I said, I, I live not too far away from uh, somebody that that tuned all kinds of accordions. Uh, Gus Escobar, I think he's also a, a sponsored with Honer, and um, and there's other people like uh, Bradley J. Williams, who was actually an apprentice not too too uh, too long ago, a couple years back up in Austin. Um, and their tuning process from my tuning process with Felipe are two complete different uh, things. And I, I hear what you're saying with the, with, um, with the, the physical or the, uh, we can hear those, those electric tuners, um, you know, getting with Felipe back when he was starting out with tuning or even playing the accordion, um, which is the same time. Um, he, they didn't have any of this stuff. This was back in the forties, fifties. Uh, and what they had was, I believe the first one was, uh, the, the tuning forks where you, you know, you could flick in and have a, a tone. Um, but actually what he used to use was a, uh, a old, uh, round tuner, which is pretty much like a harmonica, but you just put on what key you want and it's, it's got reeds in there. And that's how he would tune it because those would stay a little bit more in tune over time and better made to keep the tune. Um, but him himself has, has a very good ear. And it's true, you don't technically need a tuner. Uh, just like somebody that he was talking about with um, uh, Valerio Longoria Jr. He was telling me that Valerio Longoria, uh, uh, no, excuse me, a uh, senior, he, um, he was perfect pitch by ear. And he could tell you, oh, you know, let me, hey, can I work on your box? Cause let me tune it up, you know, cause he could just hear it. He'll do it right then and there. And that's, that to me is the, the ultimate uh, goal for it is to be able to, you know, do it by ear. But it's like you're saying, you know, some of the piano or other tuners in, in the diatonic, they don't want to use uh, electric tuners. Um, and you can hear the waves. You can hear where these reeds, because there's two of them, you can hear them where they're clashing or where the sweet spot's at. Um, but, you know, this is just one one way of, of doing it. And it's like the music. It's it's like any art. It, there's theory into it. Um, you, but you can blend your different processes of which it... To me, um, at the moment, I just need something that's in tune to be able to pitch to. Uh, but... For Felipe, he could do either one. If he wanted to do a fork or a, the old harmonica tuners or electric tuner or by ear, he's capable of it. This is just a a little bit faster pitch or a faster pace process. Be again, you have you have a lot of reads, no doubt in the, in the uh, button accordions too, but in this one, it's 124 just for a standard three row, 31 button. Uh, that So you kind of have to make up for time when you're working, um, but... I do have one more question for you specifically, Hunter. Yes. Uh, are, are you envisioning a career in tuning or are you going to be a performer? Or I guess you can do both, right? I, it, you could do it all. You could do right. whatever you put your mind to. Um, of course, this is just one art that I take serious. I enjoy doing it. it it's, it's around what I actually do. Um, you know, I'm around accordion players and, and I play gospel myself. So, you know, I want... You know, if the accordion, you have to tune to the accordion. If the accordion is out of tune, 
everything has to tune to that, you know, because the accordion's gonna it's gonna cause conflict if everything else is on pitch and it's off or vice versa. But um, yeah, that that is something yeah. that I am around and I, I plan on doing. It's something that I don't think will ever leave for me. Uh, so I, I hope I can do it. I I don't know if I can, if I can make a career out of it, but you know, uh, to be able to to work and hustle and make some side gigs, of course, uh, it's always an opportunity. Sure. I have one last question, perhaps, for the mentors in the room, uh, both of you. Uh, when you are teaching, uh, do you emphasize more repertoire, or do you emphasize technique, or do you emphasize emotion and expression? And that, that's really true of any music teacher anywhere. But how do you approach your teaching? Perhaps uh, let's start with uh, Daniel. Yes, and I experienced uh, my teaching, uh, and I think uh, the the basic skill and the, the emotional that that's uh, a whole thing together. I think, and I uh, I experienced uh, experienced uh, through the teaching with uh, Eric. And uh, some students, are, I I very enjoyed uh, you know the, the process that when we uh, practice and uh, the the basic skill it's much uh, related to the emotional things because of for some uh, periods if you don't have that uh, you know the skill. You cannot. The students cannot express that uh, emotional feelings. So that uh, uh, basically, uh, we practice a lot of attitude, attitude, and uh, support. You know the, the, the songs learned. So that's my experience. And uh, in the, the same time, we exchange our feelings. Sometimes I learn some. Something from uh, you know the, the young musician, young artist. They they have their feelings. Sometimes they can they can hold me what their suggestion. So we we uh, you know, promote each other. That's a, that's my some of my experience. Excellent, Juan. What about you? Technique, repertoire, or expression? What do you emphasize? All of the above, and and I, I completely agree with Daniel. Um, I mean, the the way I think of it, and I tell my students, when we're born, when you learn how to crawl, we fall. We stand up, we fall. We run, we still fall. And and so we focus on playing clean, posi positioning your finger, your skill set, and then eventually, you, they all have every individual. Especially if you have passion for music, you, you express yourself through that instrument. So you get that skill set that you might need those techniques to be able to express it, like Daniel said. But at the end of the day, you I think you need all three to be successful and be able to put it out there and be able to express it to somebody else. So. Very well put. Very well put. Well, I want to congratulate all of you. You are all fine musicians and certainly on the road to being fine musicians. But again, you're also on the road to being fine teachers. And I hope that this experience uh, with your teacher, with your mentor, will stay with you a long time. And someday you'll pay it forward, right? You too will have the students and then your students will have students. Um, you're just part of a long chain that sometimes goes back hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, right? So um, con congratulations to all of you. Does anybody else have any comment, any questions? If not, I will throw it back to Marco. Thank you, Mark, for leading that very insightful panel. Uh, it was great to hear um, all of those answers uh, a little more in depth. 
Um, I will also uh, like to say one final thank you to each of the artists who presented this evening. Uh, we have really enjoyed getting to know you and learning about your work over the course of the apprenticeship program. Uh, also, a big thank you to Ben Doyle of Ben Productions for his technical assistance during tonight's broadcast. And thank you all who joined us tonight or who are watching at a later date. Have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>